Tonight's story is about a treasure. Fake or real? It's a real treasure. Captain Kidd's? No. Sir Henry Morgan? Not even Henry Morgan's. No pirates, huh? No pirates, sorry. Well, what kind of treasure are you talking about? Freedom. Mm -hmm. So that's the treasure. And that's the story. The NBC University of the Air presents We Came This Way, a new historical series for our listeners at home and overseas. With John W. Vandercook as the narrator, we present Chapter 6, a story of the struggle for the freedom of men's minds in We Came This Way. This is a story of men who have no statues or memorials built in their native land. For the heritage of freedom that they left behind has been betrayed. The time is the year of our Lord, 1509. Europa stands upon the threshold of a modern age. The shadowy shape of the world to come looms large. Men's minds question the cold, Gothic universe of the Middle Ages. And their senses, like an astonished caress, discover the beauties of Greek civilization. A wind blows across Europe, up from the Italian south, bright and vigorous, up from the rich silken cities of Florence, Genoa, and Venice, up from fabulous Rome it comes, a reawakening, a blossoming, an emancipation of men's reason. The wind brings a new learning, a new philosophy, humanism, a new expectancy, a renaissance. Europa stirs like Lazarus come from the dead. Only 16 years ago in 1492, an obscure sea captain discovered a new barbaric world. Out of marble and a vision, Michelangelo fashions his Moses in Rome. Galileo's machine brings the heavens closer to the earth. Look, there goes Vesalius, the anatomist. In Rotterdam, Erasmus argues for the translating of the scriptures into the people's tongue. Copernicus, Holbein, Albrecht Dürer, Sebastian Brandt. The year is 1509, and the place, Germany. Sixteenth-century Germany, a crazy quilt of a land, an idiot tom of tatters of armed and suspicious cities under the sovereignty of the Holy Roman Empire and its Emperor Maximilian I who, by the grace of God and powerful feudal princes, rules this land. But the wind blowing from the south is blowing strong here, driving the darkness from the minds of men, raising the enormous question of man's relationship to man. And throughout this fragmentary patchwork empire, scholars arise, seekers after truth. And foremost among them stands John Reuchlin, scholar, teacher, and humanist whose life was peaceful and filled with quiet study until his 54th year. Yes, I repeat, you, my students, are more fortunate than I. For before you, in all its promise, lies the immense discovery of the world. As the unknown sailor Columbus did, you approach a new and varied shore. Behind you, like a cathedral built to the universality of God, rises the wisdom of the past. Take that wisdom and with it widen the possibilities and hopes of man. Treasure the holy languages of Greek and Hebrew through which God first spoke to us. Spread the learning we have won from them. Treat it as the heritage of man. Until we meet again, my students, God bless you all. That God is love, man is hope, and the bond between them is combined in an indescribable. What a time to be alive! You loan me a golden bayman, I promise I'll pay you back. Pfeffercorn, eh? Oh, it's you, Van Houten. What brings you to the enemy, Pfeffercorn? A love of the new learning, my brother? No, no, wait, don't go. I have no time to waste with poets and scriveners. I have things to do. So have we all. Some for honesty, Peppercorn, and some for treachery. 
I would watch my tongue, Ulrich von Houten. It speaks its own mind, my friend. For the life of me, I can't make a gentleman out of it. Uh, wait, sir. What is it? How did you like good Reuchlin's letter, Pfefferkorn? He speaks well. Is that the sum of your applause, Pfefferkorn? I have no talent for flattery. But fairness, Pfefferkorn, fairness in God's name. His words reveal a whole world to come, and all you can find to say is that he speaks well. But there must be more. There is. Huh? Instead of Holy Greek in Hebrew, I'd rather he spoke of Holy German. My Lord Prince, the danger is very great. That I could discern myself, Peppercorn. This new learning is like a plague in the universities. At Erfurt in Freiburg... In providing myself an informer, I could have done better with an ass. I know all these things, Peppercorn. Patience, my lord. It will shortly come together. You come by a long and dull route, man. Well? The peasant's yoke is a heavy one, my lord. They still stand. But they are restless, though without confidence or courage to do more than groan. These humanists will give them what they lack, my lord. For their nonsense about the freedom of men's reason and potentialities will sift and diffuse down to the mass. And a time will come when, on the strength of it, a peasant who used this scythe to cut his hay will use it for a bloodier cutting. So? So, my lord, I've found a way to cut down the tree before it blooms. Oh. We will discredit them. Discredit whom? Peasants? No, my lord, the bookworms. Hmm. How? We will drive a wedge against their new learning by attacking their holy Greek and Hebrew. Their holy Greek and Hebrew? Their holy Hebrew first, my lord. We will get more support for that. Will you speak sense, man? In the name of winning the Jews to Christianity, we will confiscate and burn all their books, my lord. In the fire we light, will burn the humanists. But I will not be surprised, my lord, if in this we find them to be enemies of the church. Peppercorn, your pardon. I have maligned your intelligence. What would you have me do? A mandate, my lord prince. Get me a mandate from the emperor. <laughs> Let us not permit sentimentality to rob us of our value. But these scholars are men of prestige, my lord. They are firebrands, sire. They sow the sparks of our destruction. But this way, my lord. Sire, let us be frank. We princes of the realm elected you to your throne. And we princes keep you there. Is this a threat? Oh, no, sire. But if the floor beneath us rots away, if our strength is slowly sapped, by this present danger, when the time comes, you and your throne may have no more protection than a common beggar in a public stocks. Will you sign the mandate, sire? Yes. Yes, I'll sign. <laughs> Maximilian, Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, after solemn conclave with my princes of the realm, do hereby command Albert, Archbishop of Mainz, to gather evidence on the subject of Hebrew books, whether it would be praiseworthy and beneficial to our holy religion to destroy such books. Further, do I command that the Archbishop secure the suggestions of Jakob von Hochstaden, Victor von Carbon, and Dr. John Reuchlin upon this matter? Such, Such suggestions, suggestions to be set, set in writing and given to John Pfefferkorn, my ambassador in this matter, signed this day of our Lord by my you hand. You make and... more of it than is there, Ulrich. Do I, Dr. Reuchlin? It's my suspicious nature, Dr. Reuchlin. 
And your cynicism. I find nothing ideal about Pfefferkorn. What does the mandate actually command, Rick? An opinion, a suggestion. And it leaves the gathering of evidence in the archbishop's hands. A friend to the new learning. In 1,500 years, we failed to convert them. Doctor, I think it's a trap. Perhaps. I think that the princes are striking out at us, and through you. Why don't you leave Cologne, Doctor? Go away, Ulrich. Truth has but a handful of champions as it is. No, Ulrich. If it is a trap, I shall try to be the only one to fall in it. Aye, like the cornerstone of a great wall. And on a bright November morning, Dr. John Reuclin went to the Archbishop's Palace to give his opinion. And in the great hall of the palace were crowded barons and knights and priests. The giant tapestries on the walls stirred with their motion. Behold the miracle of Pfefferkorn, Doctor. A serpent sitting amongst grown men. Glory. Truly, this is a momentous event, Doctor. I see ambassadors of all the prince electors. The Inquisitor of Cologne. A monk or two I don't trust. The hall has more the look of a field of battle than a congress of learned opinion. Quiet, Ulrich. The archbishop is... My lords. My lords. Please, my lords. His highness, the emperor Maximilian, sends his good wishes, my lords, and begs that no malice guide us in our deliberations here this day. Uh, Pfefferkorn smiles. I will add my hope to his majesty's, my lords. For we are here in the sight of God, and upon his work. Let us not in manner of thought, or deed, or word, profane it, nor cast a single shadow upon the light of his divine justice. Before me lies the imperial mandate, my lords, upon the subject, whether it be praiseworthy and beneficial to our holy religion, to destroy such books as the Jews use, and commanding the opinions of three learned men. Victor von Carbon, is such an opinion prepared? It is, Your Reverence. Jakob von Hochstraten. I am ready, Your Reverence. And you, Dr. John Erkman? I am prepared. Then, Victor von Carbon, read us yours. I never liked his face, Doctor. It formed his opinion before his brains. My Lord. If you please, my lord. Your reverence, my noble lords, my opinion is brief and to the point. I say, the books of the Jews be burnt. We cannot hope to win them to our religion unless we destroy the root of theirs. Burn each one. The Old Testament, the Talmud, the Kabbalah. Destroy them not only for the good of our church, but for the good of Germany. Yes, yes. For Germany? <laughs> Doctor, I see the fine, unsubtle hand of our princes in this. Yes, Your Reverence, that is all. The Emperor's thanks, my lord. Now, Jakob von Hochstraten. Your Reverence, I find no need to read my lengthy opinion, for the sum of it meets with Brother von Carbon's thoughts. I, too, say... Burn their books. These assassins kill justice twice. I am through, Your Reverence. The Emperor's thanks, my lord. That makes two opinions, my lord. Both for burning. We have one more. Dr. John Roy. Are you afraid, Doctor? You stand alone here. Do not worry, Uri. They eye you like a starved, unpaid executioner. Dr. Roy. I am ready, Your Reverence. My lords, <clears throat> I speak not here in hasty judgment. For a man's opinion is an uncertain thing. Time, the ultimate critic, often has proved him wrong. And not alone time, my lords, but ignorance and the power of self-interest often colors the conclusions of men. In this matter, I have tried to be impartial, to come to it not like an unyielding enemy, but like an honest scholar. What are these books that you would burn? 
commentaries, books on ceremonies, on arts and sciences, poetry and fables. Before a judgment can be rendered on these, they must be subject to a careful examination. Not piecemeal, not by hearsay, not by hostility. It is true, my lords, there is much that is contrary to our holy religion in these books, but that is the nature of their belief, a belief which is protected by law. Yet, yet there is also much of great value to our religion in these same books. For example, the Kabbalah. It is my opinion that this work assures us, as none other, of the divinity of Christ, their commentaries, my lord, are invaluable, for they help scholars understand the Old and New Testaments more fully. My lords, it would not be beneficial or praiseworthy to destroy these books. I stand against this burning. Oh, oh, no, no. My lord, my lord, your reverence, a word, your reverence. What is it? John Peppercorn. I have a word to say, if it please your reverence. Well? My lords, for 30 years I have fought as a warrior of our church. But never, never, my lords, have I heard the anti-Christian light of this. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, true. What have we heard from the lips of, of, of this learned man, this advocate of humanism? is treason to the Mother Church. Hidden oh, amongst us is the Inquisitor of Cologne, our guardian in such matters. I demand that Dr. Jean Reichlin be seized and tried before the Inquisitor's court as an enemy of the Church. And thus did the feudal princes strike their first blow against the humanist scholars of the land and the enormity of the plan. The realization of what and who was the real victim slowly seeped into the consciousness of the teachers, the poets, and the painters. And for the first time in history, men of goodwill came together to fight back. Quiet. Quiet. Let Holbein the painter speak. Yes, Holbein. Yes. Uh, I say that von Houten is right. The princes are perverting the office of the Inquisition. They use it against us. They threaten the whole development of culture in this land. Reuchlin's not the whole culture. No, but what he stands for is the free inquiry after truth, the right to explore his world and widen it with knowledge and with art. If they burn Reuchlin, they burn our prestige. They bring back an eternal night for the bright day we found. They'll plunge mankind into a pit. If he can't see it yet, Holbein, draw a picture for him. <laughs> <laughs> Let Albrecht Dürer draw. I'll paint. You'll paint, Holbein, and Dürer will draw, but for Reuchlin. Eh? And I'll sweat poems out of this pen of mine. And Melanchthon will give us tracts. I say the pen is mightier than the sword, brothers. I say truth will batter down the strongest fortress in this land. The words have a fine poetic ring, Ulrich. But what's the meaning? Yes. This. We'll fight for Reuchlin. Each in his own way, but together. And we will defend what is most sacred to us all. Our ideals and hopes for the coming world. The freedom of men's minds for the unhampered search for truth. This we will fight for by defending Reuchlin. Our skill with words, with pencil and brush, will be fighting for ourselves. Well... I'll paint. I will Good. Do I'll draw. And I'll write tracks. Brothers, we'll fight until the sound of our rallying reaches Rome and they hear what's been done in this land. Witness against the Dr. John Reutlin, Bastion Baum of Strasbourg. Of the my Lord Prince. Eh? What is it, Peppercorn? May I see you privately, my Lord? It cannot wait. Come this way. It has only just come to my attention, my Lord. What is it? This, my Lord. Look at it. A drawing? By Albrecht Dürer. Why, this is you, Peppercorn, in chains. And you, my Lord, behind me, also in chains. What? 
Descending into the mouth of hell while Christ commands us down. How dare he? Not only he, my lord. Here, a track by Melanchthon, a poem by Ulrich von Hutten, all attacking us. I'll have them flogged. It's not as simple as that, my lord. They are all fighting back. These, these bookworms? Aye, it is the miracle of the age. The bookworms, marching as one. I'll have them buried as one. Yes, my lord. Meanwhile, there are questions being asked in Rome. The Pope? And the Cardinals. These bookworms' voices seem to have carried across the Alps. Will they act? In Rome, I mean? I do not know, my lord. Then we must move swiftly, Peppercorn. Reuschlin must be a corpse before they do. <laughs> Rome act, Your Reverence. I... I cannot tell, Ulrich, my son. Will they permit such perversion of the Inquisitor's office? God's justice moves in inscrutable ways, Ulrich. But the princes move as clear as air. Ulrich. Forgive my heat, Your Reverence, but I see not Reuchlin and an honored natural death, but Reuchlin at the stake. I have received questions from Rome. They are not asleep, my son. But time, time, Your Reverence, time's running out. What would you have me do? The Inquisitor is not of my diocese. I am aware of how monstrous is this thing the princes are doing. My anger is as sincere as yours, Ulrich. I know that, Your Reverence. You, you've done much for us. But you would have me do more. Yes. What? Send the Pope another appeal. the clamor and protest of the enlightened men of 16th Germany, 16th century Germany rose and gained strength. And as the feudal princes of the realm drove on the murderous persecution with a renewed vigor, the surprised questions in Rome became angry answers. This is a monstrous act. They pervert the offices of the mother church. The prosecutors are the true enemies of the church. Like a sword in battle, the issue grew bright and sharp. Would a massive door be clanged shut upon men's minds, trapping them in the narrow medieval world? The question hung like a headsman's axe over the future of Germany. And upon a spring day when enlightenment in this land stood like a criminal before the Inquisitor's court, Rome acted. The Pope reserved judgment to himself. My Lord Emperor, His Holiness, Pope Leo X, has in his wisdom seen fit to reserve judgment to himself upon the charges of Dr. John Reuchlin as an enemy of the church. He appoints as his ambassador in this matter myself, Bishop of Spire, who alone is authorized either to free or condemn said John Reuchlin. <laughs> Prince Electors are here, Your Reverence. Let them come in. The bishop will see you, my lords. Good day to you, Your Reverence. Good day to you, my lords. I am honored by your visit. You know why we are here, Your Reverence. My judgment on Reuchlin? Yes. I have not reached any as yet. He is guilty. That remains to be seen, my lord. The evidence is conclusive, Your Reverence. What he said regarding the Hebrew book... I have be... not read it all. Your Reverence, let us cease this playing. The issue and the guilt are clear in our eyes, and immediate action is necessary. Our peasants grow restless with these fools' words about the potentiality of man. We are good Christians, Your Reverence, but we are also princes of an empire. We will defend our land and rights with all the strength we can command. And, Your Reverence, we will defend yours, the churches. Be with us in this matter, and we will build you the finest cathedral in all Germany. It is as I have said, my lords. As yet, I have not read all the evidence. A 
gentleman to see you, Your Reverence. A. von Hurten. Let him come in. The bishop will see you, sir. You are Ulrich von Hutten? Yes, Your Reverence. Now is the time to strike the blow for freedom. God would have it so. You, you... Take heart, whose heart for freedom still can beat. No longer bend your will to those whose lies have wrought us ill. My poem, Your Reverence. Yes. And a very good poem, too, my son. Thanks, Your Reverence. But, but, have I reached a decision? Yes, Your Reverence. What will you build for me, you scholars, poets, and painters? Build? The princes of the empire have promised me the finest cathedral in all Germany, if I see this matter their way. What will you promise, if I see it yours, my son? A poem, Your Reverence. My feelings and those of hundreds of others poured into a paltry poem. Mm, I think God's justice, my son, likes the style of your architecture best of all. And in a few days, the papal legate, the Bishop of Spire, rendered judgment. I, Bishop of Spire with full authorization from His Holiness, Pope Leo X, find that the writings and teachings of John Reuchlin, in reference to such books as the Jews use, as not being harmful to our Mother Church. And further do I find John Peppercorn, instigator of these charges, guilty of slander and find him a son... And the fight was won. The attack upon the emancipation of men's mind upon the freedom of their reason, was foiled. But only for a little while. What began as a great promise was wiped out in the blood of countless peasants as Germany from 1518 to 1648 plunged into a century of civil wars. And after the final struggle, the Thirty Years' War, the nation was devastated and impoverished. The peasants in brutal servitude, great provinces raised by fire and sword. Science and art had fled and the great hopeful learning of the universities was replaced by narrow, pedantic ignorance. It was the dream of the feudal princes that ultimately won the land. And because that dream is still murderously alive in Germany today, we comprehend how enormous is the betrayal of those early years. That heritage of freedom left by the scholars, the poets, and the painters stands like forgotten ruins in a lost land. Yet, because the fight for liberty belongs to the whole history of man, because it is the heritage of all peoples, it belongs to us. On the way we came, these were the initial battles. These laid the pattern for our democratic world. Thus we, citizens and soldiers of this republic, claim that heritage as ours. NBC University of the Air has brought you Chapter 6 of the new historical series, We Came This Way. Next week, We Came This Way will present a story of the Netherlands in the days of William the Silent. Tonight's script was written by Rafael Hayes and directed by Ira Avery. The original music is composed by Leo Kempinski and conducted by Milton Katams. The members of the cast were Alexander Scooby, Joe DeSantis, Martin Wolfson, Don Morrison, Maurice Torplin, John Martin, David Kerman, John Archer, and Gregory Morton. Your narrator was John W. Vandekoek. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Mm -hmm.